thank you guys so much for being with us. I'm super excited to have Denise Schreiber, Miss Know-It-All with us. Thank you for joining us again. It was a fantastic uh, webinar that we did uh, several months ago, and I'm super happy to have you and Miss Isis, should she make an appearance, uh, her beautiful cat. Uh, but we are talking about garden controversies today, those myths and tricks that we see that are purported on internet and Pinterest and beyond that we would love to try, but don't actually work. So thank you so much, Denise, for being with us. You know, almost every day, you know, I started doing this talk um, about four years ago, and at least once a week, I've got to add more stuff to it because I'm just like, are you kidding me? So I call this urban myths and legends in the garden, or I've got a bridge in Brooklyn I can sell you cheap. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. if, if you remember when you were a kid, you know, because there was the commercial where the girl was um, outside and her friend was, I don't know, changing the tire or something. And she said, oh, I'm waiting for my um, boyfriend. He's a French model. And this guy comes lumbering down, definitely overweight, got a fanny pack in front to make his belly look even. And he comes up and goes, bonjour. Um, <laughs> because if it's on the internet, it must be true. Right. So if you were a kid, you were in Girl Scouts or you know, just with your friends, you remember the game, you tell a secret and you'd whisper in somebody's ear right? and everybody would pass it around. So my favorite is Joe and Mary met at a party. The next thing you hear is Joe and Mary robbed the store, ran away together and opened up a tattoo parlor in South America because that's how these things get started. That's right. So, you know, one of the myths, um, I, these people, I, I don't know where they have this time. So there's the myth of how to tell the sex of peppers or how do peppers have sex. So, <laughs> so does that have to do with how many bumps are on the bottom of the pepper? Exactly. So if you flip them over and they're talking predominantly about bell peppers. Right. And so let's see, I had to write this down. The ones with four bumps are females and those with three bumps are male. The females are full of seeds, but sweeter and better for eating raw. And the males are better for cooking. Um, so what do you call chili peppers, poblanos, jalapenos? Are they eunuchs? Because I don't know what. <laughs> <laughs> There's no bumps, right? So we can't tell. That's right. And if anything, they would be the ones looking at them. They would be the ones that actually have sex. <laughs> so. So, and then the myth and legend of marigolds repel insects and critters in the garden. So there is a type of marigold that repels nematodes, were, which are a microscopic, not insect, but a problem in the ground. And it's only, I wanna say the African marigolds, and they exude this substance through their roots and that repels the nematodes. And predominantly in Pennsylvania, we don't have those types of nematodes. They are more in the South. Although we have nematodes, but just not those. Oh, that's interesting. So a lot of people, because they heard they repelled something and that's all they heard. They don't realize that, you know, just because a lot of people don't like the smell of marigolds. I happen to like it. It's kind of a fresh smell. It doesn't repel bunnies. It doesn't repel groundhogs. It definitely doesn't repel the deer. It's just people want to, now they'll say, well, I planted them and they never bothered them. That just means they haven't found them yet. That's, <laughs> that's the only difference. They haven't found them yet. Yeah, um, I agree with you because I have a groundhog and he has never met a plant that he won't eat, especially if it has fruit on it. He will right, take- They will climb a tree. They can, they're climbers. They can climb a tree. Let me tell you, I watched this guy last year jump four feet like a cat on top of a wall. I just about dropped everything in my hands when I saw him do that because I was under the mistaken impression that my stone walls were keeping him out. Oh no, he's just an obstacle course for my little hungry hippo who loves to take one bite out of every fruit that I have. So uh, if you've got any tips for how to protect my peach trees now that I know that he can climb them, I'd love to know because I've got a lot of fruit this year. Yeah. Um, so actually, there is um, a product. You would probably have to look at a, maybe a farm supply 
or the or what is it farm tech catalog and there's um bird spikes and they're oh. just plastic but you normally they would put them on top of something but you right. could actually wrap them around so oh, the spikes great don't idea. down okay yep i will give that a try because i am so proud of myself we moved these uh, white peach trees to a new area this year. And white peaches, oh, I want some, I love them. Okay, done. Well, you have to come visit the far, the farmhouses uh, or I mean, the uh, garden houses and I will, I'll trade you. But I am so excited because uh, despite moving them in the spring, they are loaded with peaches. So we are really excited to see them and hopefully eat a few this year. Yeah. But speaking of pests, obviously dealing with pests in the garden as a gardener is really difficult. You know, have you found that there are tricks that you can use to keep away those pesky mosquitoes this time of year? The mosquitoes? Yeah. Actually, you want to remove any standing water that you may have, and they can breed in half an inch of water. Wow. Yeah. So daily, you may want to clean out your bird bath, you know, unless, well, in this heat, it pretty much dries up. If you have a shady area, um, like where you're growing hostas, they will actually be on the underside of the hosta leaves. People don't think, yeah. So you may want to just kind of go in and, and take your hose and just kind of rattle it a little bit. You can also put mosquito dunks if you have a pond or you know a, a fountain of some type, you can put the mosquito dunks in and that'll keep them down. You know, some areas are actually spraying for them because they've been so bad. So it, it really depends on your area and, you know, the impact of the mosquitoes as to what they're going to do locally. Yeah, and certainly that's a, a, a big controversy here in central Pennsylvania right now because we're having a spotted lantern flies. So they're spraying for them. And the sad thing is, is what kills them also kills our beneficial bugs. So we've been uh, kind of monitoring like locally um, our bee population. We're a little concerned about them this year. So certainly anything you can do to reduce the standing water is good. I also have had really good luck with herbs like lemongrass that keep them away. So I haven't planted my lemongrass this year, but it's going in because I was really seeing a lot of mosquitoes yesterday in the garden. So yeah, you can use the citronella lamps too. You know, mm -hmm. they, they work well. You know, mosquitoes look at me and they're like, oh my God, it's Babette's feast. And they just <laughs> nail me left, right, and sideways to the point I actually developed cellulitis in my leg from a mosquito bite. Oh my goodness. Yeah, they, re they really like me. Now, the one thing we talking about spotted lanternfly, I know we're a little off the subject here. We have it here too. <clears throat> Not as bad as you yet, but we do have it here. So two things they can do rather than they're not doing all over spraying for them. There is the take that you can get at True Value hardware stores. It's about, I don't know, two, two feet wide and it's on a roll. And I think it's like four or $5. And you wrap it around your tree trunks and the nymphs are attracted. Right now the nymphs are out. I actually got some, unfortunately, really great shots of some nymphs at my friend's house while I was out there. And that's what she, you know, is using on there. If it's a multi-stem tree, you've got to do it that way. But we also they, want to wrap that with like hardware cloth, right? To keep the birds and so forth from accidentally sticking to that, right? Right. But yeah. make it really big because yeah. the nymphs are really in there. And the other thing is too, <clears throat> most of them, you know, I mean, most of the tree companies are doing injections as a or drenches as opposed to because really overall spraying they're treating for mosquitoes they're not treating for yeah. uh spot and land fly because right. it really doesn't affect them yeah people who think they're chickens and the birds are going to eat them well apparently now as the uh, nymphs they may eat them but as the winged adults they won't eat them they won't eat them because of their coloration it looks yeah. like it's a, a poisonous right so instinctively they won't eat it Right. So you can't depend on the birds to take care of them. You do have to be very vigilant in your garden about them, you know, and they leave your vegetables alone. That's the thing. They leave your vegetables. But if you've got grapevines, Ooh, that's right. trees, shrubs, apparently they do like fruit trees more, yep. you know, and, so. and grapevines. I understand our grapevines are really being decimated. Um, right. Yep. 
So speaking of animals eating things, <laughs> you and I have had lots of discussions about deer. Yes. So what are some myths that you know about deer that don't work, okay. but things that might work? I got a dog in a seven foot fence. <laughs> <laughs> that works really well. Uh, <laughs> So um, there's the myth of hanging bags of human hair and bars of Irish spring or scraping. So no, you know, your neighbors are gonna think you're crazy because you've got all this stuff hanging out there. And not only that, it loses its scent. Right. So there are the deer repellents and I recommend actually alternating them if you don't have a big yard, but, and you're a little concerned about the price, maybe your neighbor would want to split it with you. And so I would recommend getting plant skid, liquid fence. Bobex works really well. Deer away. Um, there's another one I'm forgetting. Mm. And now, you mentioned to me one time you've got a homemade recipe for those really waxy hot peppers that also works pretty well. Yeah, it's not a homemade recipe. It is actually, you can purchase it at a garden center. It's called hot pepper wax. And it also works on insects, so, but it has to be direct contact. But the hot pepper wax, I will mix a little of that in. We call that a tank mix. And I will actually mix that in with whatever, liquid fence, what, whatever I'm using. And not only do they get the bad smell, but they also get that hot pepper. Now, if you are using hot pepper wax, wear gloves, because if you've ever cut a hot pepper up and touched your eyes, you know how painful it is. This is 100 times more painful and wear eye protection. And don't spray it, obviously, on a windy day, no matter what, because you're going to come home or come inside and you're going to stink like the <laughs> repellent and the hot pepper wax. I try to do that late in the evening before I come in to take my shower. And I just leave my clothes in the laundry room. That's a good piece of advice. That way you don't uh, contaminate yourself and everybody else with Yeah, when people come in and start going, what died? <laughs> So Denise, there's lots and lots and lots of really bad advice on how to control weeds. Have you found anything that is a myth to actually be a fact when it comes to controlling weeds with things like, oh, cornmeal? No, cornmeal does not work. Cornmeal actually will encourage, uh, you know, nitrogen growth on weeds. Cornmeal, and it's not and let's be clear, it's the corn gluten meal. It is not the corn meal that you're going to make your grandmother's uh, cornbread with. That's not that. You, If you use that, you're going to attract ants because they're going to go, oh, look what they put on for us to eat. So what you want to do is use the corn meal, gluten, corn gluten meal. You've got me saying it now. Sorry. And you want to apply it early in the spring and it will control. It will not eliminate any seeds. If you already have established weeds, it has no effect on it, whatever. It will encourage it to grow, actually. If you are um, looking to get, you have them in the cracks, your sidewalk, driveway, whatever, there's the mixture that makes me crazy. And there's so many variation on the internet that if I ever found, find the person who started this, I'm going to rip their heart out and show it to them before they die. <laughs> It, it's a mixture of Dawn dish soap and varying quantities of either Epsom salts or just salt, um, vinegar, and sometimes it includes water, sometimes it doesn't. So there is a horticultural vinegar. See, this is a problem. Somebody heard vinegar but didn't listen to the whole thing. There's a horticultural vinegar that you can buy. It is considered organic. You can buy it at garden centers. And it's anywhere between 20 to 30% acetic acid. Heinz 57, and I'm in Pittsburgh, and my stepfather worked for Heinz. It, it's for canning. It's 5% acetic acid. And if you buy the generic, that's only 4% acetic acid. So it doesn't, you know, you might get a little top kill on a very tender weed, but if you're trying to get rid of something like thistle, it's going to go, <laughs> you know, and laugh at you. Not only that, it kills beneficials in the ground. You, you think of beneficials, you're thinking of butterflies and bees and everything. But there's a lot of beneficials that you don't see that, you know, aren't, you know, they're not cute and furry like a, a kitten that you would have. So 
don't use that at all. Please don't use that at all. You can buy the horticultural vinegar. Again, it's considered organic where eye protection, it is acetic acid, same as your pickle juice and, and gloves, and it will take it. Now for perennial weeds, such as thistle, you may have to do a few applications with it, pure and simple. Not everything goes away on the first try. I, I'm about ready to take a flamethrower to my thistle. I have not found a good way to get rid of it. Um, so we're going to sheet cardboard it this year and see if that helps because everything else I've tried, I'm just at my wits end. So if you've got a good, good, piece actually, of you mind, shouldn't use, actually, you shouldn't use cardboard because okay. it actually reduces the amount of oxygen that like earthworms and everybody gets too. Okay. So you're better off with a flamethrower. You may torture <laughs> Seriously, you may torture All right. I'll remind my husband of that when I'm out there burning things in the garden. He's like, what are you doing exactly? So I uh, have some water nearby. Okay, I'll do that. For soil, there's a misperception that you should just till it up every single year. Why do you not want to do that? Well, for one reason, you're destroying the, what we call the tilt, the texture of the soil. Um, my vegetable garden is mounted. It, it, they're raised beds, but they kind of look like grave mounds, but it, it works for me. I, the only digging I do there is when I'm planting my tomatoes and everything else in there. I do not till the soil. I haven't toiled, tilled my soil in probably 15 years. And I have a nice little mantis tiller as well. I just don't till anymore. The other problem is when you are actually doing that, you bring up weed seeds. And for an example, crabgrass, the seed's viable for 40 years. Right. So that's why you really don't want to till. Yeah. Add your compost. You know, now if you, uh, a lot of people grow like oats or winter rye or something as a uh, cover crop, cover crop, you mm -hmm. know, you have to cut it down. You can lightly dig that in, but you don't want to be in there with, you know, the heavy equipment going, uh, and Absolutely. You know, destroying everything else. Well, and it's, it's a very valid point. It's a very serious issue. Um, I was watching a farmer nearby because we have lots of farms here uh, till his uh, his uh, build and I'm watching the topsoil blow away as he's tilling. So we're losing about four inches of topsoil a year. This is a very serious topic. And if you're concerned about carbon emission, you are releasing carbon when you till. So if we haven't convinced you, I will be happy to continue to share videos from my garden, which is a no-till garden like Denise's. And I'm super happy to say, I don't have to weed it. So far this season, I haven't weeded once. And that's- I haven't even business. planted mine yet. I'm so far behind. <laughs> well, I think you're gonna get a reprieve. We're supposed to get a cold front coming in. So I'm looking forward to planting some more because Lord knows I've had to babysit it a lot over the last week. So there are other pests in the garden too this year that I am seeing lots of slugs and i have heard you can do eggshells to keep them away do you want to dispel that myth for us you know what save the eggshells for the compost um you know you you know unless you have a chicken farming operation and you take all their eggs and crush them up and throw them that's the only way you're going to control it you can actually use uh there's um slug it sluggo i believe this is organic you can use that for the slugs you want to keep yeah, the area, they will go over mulch. You know, so unless you have something really sharp, I don't recommend using like lava rock or any of that stuff ever. But uh, you can also get a lid, put some beer in it, and apparently they're attracted to it and it works. The downside is you got to empty it and clean out the dead slugs every day. You yeah. know, there, there was a woman in California, now they have those huge snails out there and they were eating in her garden so she managed to capture them put them in a um a bin and she was feeding them all kind of good stuff and everything and then she had escargot <laughs> it's called eating your enemy i've yes. never tried that but uh maybe it could work for sure yeah so, I'm, I'm not trying them it's like eating cicadas i'm not eating them either. no no and it's so weird we don't have them here do you have them where you no, are no we don't they're they're a little further south now i have friends down in the dc area that are getting yeah. hammered 
Yeah, no, I um, dropped the cuties off uh, to their parents on Sunday in Gettysburg, and it is deafening. It is really scary wild. So it's not, you know, It sounds like aliens invading. It does. <laughs> it is zombie invasion, for sure, of these crazy bugs. So, you know, one thing that we talked a little bit about no dig, but what about double digging? You know, that was um, pushed by the Rodale Institute years ago. I mean, I'm talking 40, 50 years ago at least. And people have gotten away from that. If you have that terrible of soil, A, you should consider maybe putting your garden somewhere else. B, you know, just start adding organic. I mean, you can do the layering of compost and it's going to take you a few years to actually, you know, get it to where you want. So if you're going to start that, I realize that maybe you live in a subdivision and they're not going to want you doing that in front of your house. They may be offended. Your HOA may come after you and fine you. Um, if, but I double digging is a lot of work. And then what do you do with the really Soil. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm with you. And, and um, to your point, you know, I have a lot of compacted soil on this property because it was a stone house and moving all of the stones and the, it really compacted the soil. And it's like trying to dig through concrete because yes, it, our, exactly. our shale level is very shallow. So I highly recommend building the soil up. Um, I've just got to the point that I don't want to work that hard and I am finding this no dig method really, really works for me. I have and, two guys outside spreading mulch because we're like, we're not doing it. Well, and that's just it. I think, you know, one of the things that I have learned the hard way are there things that I like to do and there's things that I don't do anymore. And one is spread mulch. It's just too heavy for me and it's exhausting. And in the kind of weather we're having, it's actually kind of dangerous. So um, I definitely have somebody else do quote unquote the heavy lifting. But one thing that I get a lot of questions about is, well, I'd like to have a compost pile, but don't those compost piles stink? No. What's your feedback on that? Yeah, so compost piles actually, if they are done properly, they don't smell. They should be turned. You never put meat in there. You shouldn't put uh, animal waste in there either, or, or people waste, because there are people that do that. And uh, you just turn it. What I like to do is, now their Ringers makes a compost um, bag that you actually can add to help it uh, degrade faster if you water it in. Yep. But, you know, there's plenty of horse farms, even here. I can go out and I can get a five gallon bucket of the manure covered and then in a bag to get it home. And then I add it to my compost. Uh, I have four compost bins and throw it in there just to kind of help think the hot stuff's good for putting it in. You don't want to put hot stuff on your garden because it's going to fry your plants, but in the compost bin and there is a tool and I don't know what it's called. My mother had it and it goes straight down and it has like wings and when you push it all the way down the wings open up and it's like a, like a butterfly bolt you put in the wall if anybody knows what that is and it actually helps stir the uh, compost itself and you do have to keep it moist but you have to have equal parts of green matter brown matter and then you know your kitchen scraps and if you have a lot of great kitchen scraps like watermelon it is really good to chop them up into smaller pieces rather than yep. just taking like a whole rind and throwing it in there. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. It, may, it definitely makes it go faster. And, you know, one thing that I have found too, I do some trench composting. Do you do that with like your banana peels in some, in some places or like roses? Uh, no, I actually, be, my topography is so much different than yours. I have hillsides like this, so that really doesn't work for me. Um, so everything goes into my compost bins, but trench composting works very well as long as you bury it deeply. I know people, this is one of those myths, let's take a banana peel because it has potassium, or let's, let's take a dead fish and bury it. So let me tell you, if you have raccoons, they have wonderful senses of smell, and they're going to be digging it up along with your plant. Put it in the compost bin. Don't put it underneath. I mean, you would literally be digging like four feet down so they couldn't get to it. <laughs> right. So, so we had somebody ask in the in the chat here, what is trench composting? So, 
we shouldn't assume that we know everybody knows. So let's share with with them what they. So what it they actually do. just involves digging a trench, and putting your scraps in there, and not necessarily your food scraps, but you know maybe your grass clippings, you know leaves and everything covering them. But it's and then you're going to have to wait a year for that to actually break down. You know, so you have to have enough property to do that too. Yep. So what I typically do is um, we eat a lot of bananas in this family. So I dry them. I leave them outside to sun bake. And so they are like crispy. And then I either crush it or I then rip it into shreds and uh, trench it. Um, so uh, we'll put those, uh, those deer repellents in the chat for you, Margaret. Thanks for asking. Another question we got is uh, this, this property owner has a lot of mature trees and lesser celadine oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and they've got uh, vast areas of woodland and wetland planting so we're gonna have to be careful about what we recommend here because of chemicals being getting in those wetlands hey boy they're really not gonna like this start digging it up and you have to be vigilant about it i've seen it in some parks and uh, there's there's a park called cedar creek uh, not far from me, and it sits right along the Okegany River, and it's a beautiful, you know, kind of that big wide river and the curve and the bend. It's like you see in a movie, and they've got lesser celadine in there, and it's just uh, me and my girlfriend were down there actually doing a wildflower walk, and we were actually there digging up some of the lesser celadine. <laughs> it, it, it's not enough. It's yeah, just not I, enough. You, you've got to be vigilant about it. Yeah. Now, you could, uh, whoever asked that question, they could also use the vinegar. The horticultural okay. vinegar on it now unless it's like a big patch thing it right. might be in between the grass you're probably going to kill your grass but yeah. you have to decide what is worth it for you yep um so uh someone is asking about mosquito plants do they work yeah they're right up there with the marigolds that repel the, uh, everybody you know if, if you're holding it right there yeah it's probably going to repel they might <laughs> bite you on the leg yeah you know, uh, they derive the oils from like the citronella plants, they derive the oils, and put it in a concentrated form. So, you know, when you go to boil, boil, burn the citronella candles or the lamps, that's why you get the scent. But as far as, you know, just growing it, you know, it's nice, but it's not really that effective. Yeah, probably the best ones that I have seen is is herbs. So um, I grow a lot of catnip, uh, 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 lavender, lemongrass. Uh, those are all repellent. I won't say that they're a hundred percent, but I do notice that where they are in the garden, I'm a lot less likely to get bitten. Oh, the uh, cats that need catnip. Oh uh, yeah, I will send her a bunch. In fact, I could have given you 15 plants. I've let it kind of go over the property because I have four cats and I have lots of friends with cats and they always get treats. But uh, yeah, it's self seed. So that's oh, yeah, very much so. You gotta it's be careful. Mint. Now. It's, it's, it's mint. Yeah. When, when you plant mint, you always have mint. <laughs> true, true of that. Cats don't mind, but other yeah, people So might. one thing I want to talk about, uh, Pam spray, you know, the stuff you spray on yeah. the, um, what do you call it? Uh, your pans, you know, or, you know, if you're baking something. Somewhere along the line, somebody cheap, because a lot of gardeners are really cheap, and this bothers me, thought that using PAM spray would smother insects on your houseplants. Now, Consolidated Foods owns PAM, and I actually had a conversation with them, and they said it's for food. It is not for that. The problem with using the PAM or, or the organic PAM is it sticks to the plants, it makes it sticky, then, you know, it catch, catches cat hair, dust, you know, uh, it clogs the pores of the plants, so you're not doing it any good. There is a horticultural oil, um, it's called an ultra fine oil, that for certain insects like scale, works very well on scale on house plants, but you know, you have to read the label. Does it say I can use it on my jade plant or my coffee plant or whatever? Because a lot of plants don't tolerate those sorts of things. But right. yeah, you don't want to be using PAM. And, you know, just, just like here, any chemicals that you use as a homeowner, you are responsible for. 
And the most number one bought and used chemical by homeowners is gypsophate. And I see people spraying it indiscriminately without gloves on with, you know, open toed shoes and just spraying for all they're worth around their houses. And I just want to caution you that that's probably not a really safe idea. So use it sparingly and be super careful to protect yourself when you are spraying it. Yeah, actually the label suggests I am a licensed pesticide applicator and I have been for 35 years is the quickest way to get poisoning, pesticide poisoning is your eyes, your nose, your mouth, which make perfect sense. The palms of your hands, the thin skin along your forearm and well, there's two other places, but they apply to men. Um, one is if you're bald, you need to have half uh -huh. protection. Good and question. a lot of men will sit on a step and mix it up on the step holding the container between their legs. And sometimes, uh-huh. <laughs> and, and sometimes there's a spill and they can, because that particular type of skin is so thin, they can get pesticide poisoning through there. Oh, wow. So uh, note to self, be very careful where you are mixing your pesticides and make sure that you take the extra step to protect your skin and eyes and face. Right. Well your hands, so. <laughs> so, the, you know, one of the other Period. things is like cinnamon repels. Oh, yeah. Does cinnamon repel ants? I had that on my list. Yeah. Well, you know what? It will, but if, you know, you go like the craft store or something, that cinnamon, once you start grinding it up, kind of loses its scent and it might keep them for a while but they're going to come back that's sure. all there is to it you know and then um using epsom salts for blossom end rot it mean because there is some calcium in it it means your soil is lacking calcium so you really should get a soil test done yeah. you know and don't get one of the ones that are at the big box store or whatever get it from I'm going to assume everybody here is from Pennsylvania, but otherwise you're land grant university for us. It's Penn state. Also, you know, they say using powdered milk will also do it again. It has some calcium to it, but you, your soil is lacking and that's what you need to do. Sometimes what you'll have the problem with is actually we're going to have heat and then cold heat and cold. And that can also cause some, the cause blossom and rock um right so so temp so peppers especially are really susceptible to uh temperature changes that's one thing you might think about um peppers and, like heat that's one thing peppers right like heat and tomatoes do too so if you've got major variations in temperature and you started your vegetables early you may find that they kind of pause and that's because they're a little bit um basically they're shocked because they exactly. don't like that cold weather inconsistent watering as well can play a major role as to whether or not your plants will drop their flowers so be consistent to water deep not often water, water, water the roots not the leaves right absolutely yeah. so um one thing that we're talking about too today is grass clippings there's a misperception that if you cut the grass and you leave the grass clippings that it'll cause thatch true or false Unless your grass is a foot tall, it's not going to cause thatch. And most mowers, I just invested in a battery powered motor, which I love because it doesn't make as much noise. All I got to do is push a button and pull back the handle and it goes. Most mowers now are self mulching. So what that means is it really chops up the blades of grass really fine and you really don't know if you haven't cut your grass or it's your first cut in the spring and you've let it go. Yeah, you probably do want to bag that because it would cause issues and probably just kill some of the grass where the, what we call the hay um, would lay. But no, it doesn't cause it. In fact, actually it releases nitrogen and is a fertilizer for your grass. So I rarely, bag mine mine is like oh good now put it on there and especially in this heat we're having you want to cut your grass at three inches high grass is not meant to be cut like the green at the golf course right that is a special type of grass it's called a bent grass and it has to be cut every day and i'm pretty sure nobody wants to go cutting your grass every day but but if you let that grow 
it actually dies. But for our grass, if you cut it too short, it is going to die. Yeah. In this heat, you definitely want to keep it high. And if you have someone that cuts it for you, ask them to either cut less often or cut higher for sure, 100%. Yeah. So uh, one question I have, because I'd love to grow things in pots, is should you put gravel in the pot? No, 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 no. And it makes it heavier. And you shouldn't. I just, uh, and, and here's a new one I just saw the other day, taking plastic bottles and putting it in the bottom of pots. Um, the only thing you need to do, and this is if you're really anal about it, is you can put a little piece of paper towel over the hole to keep the dirt from coming out. But once it sinks and you got the plant in, it's not going to come out at all. But other than that, when you put all this stuff in, so I'm trying to do it so you can see this. So here's your pot. If you fill it this high with gravel, packing pellets, whatever, your plants are only gonna have this much root space. Whereas if you put them in soil all the way, the roots can go all the way down because the roots are only gonna go as far as the water. So you definitely don't wanna use that if you have, I have big container, I have like 30 inch containers. If you have a problem because you don't want to move it, they make plenty of those little rolling discs that you can put your plant on and roll it around and get it out of the way. And they have them for house plants too. So okay. that's the way to go and skip them. I, I got a great one this year that holds 50 pounds because of that, because my pots are big and they're heavy and it's difficult for uh, my husband and I to move them. So you cut a tree, you're pruning your tree. Should you, should you paint the wound? Nope, you shouldn't paint the wounds. That used to be considered standard practice, but what they've discovered is if you're having either an insect or a disease issue, you're sealing it in. The tree will naturally heal itself. So you have to make, make three cuts. So you make one to take off the heaviest part of the branch further out. Then you make another one on the top, and then you make your cut underneath at the call, but right in front of the collar. And that way you don't rip the bark when the branch comes off. So great. that's the way to cut it, but you don't want to just, you know, willy nilly get in there and start cutting. Um, a, a couple uh, ones, peonies do not attract ants <laughs> because Peony buds are so huge. I love them. I just love them. Me too. That you see the ants on them, but they don't need them to open. The ants are going there for the nectar, but just because the buds are so big, that's why you see them. You know, there's plenty of other little critters getting in there as well. And, you know, that works really well. Castor beans, I love this one, is a natural form of birth control. <laughs> you like that one? <laughs> so for those of you that don't understand, if you remember a while back, people were getting ricin laced letters, you know, in the government and probably a few other people. And ricin is derived from castor beans. All parts of the castor beans are poisonous. That's why the deer don't eat them. The rabbits don't. Nobody eats castor beans. You know, you're actually safe planting castor beans. And there's so you can carmen cedar red is a beautiful plant. Um, but you'll be attending funerals otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I also um, heard there, I went to this little town on the, in, on the ocean in uh, Texas where they grow a lot of oleander. And they That's said every year they have tourists who kill themselves by uh, barbecuing hot dogs on oily, oleander branches, which are poisonous. So note to self. Oh, I can add that to my list now. Yes. Let's not barbecue with an oleander branch unless or, po okay. or poison ivy. Yeah, don't burn poison ivy. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, that that that'll land you in the hospital. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so I have read that you can stick your weeds down in a pot and water pour water over them for 24 hours and get nitrogen out of the weeds to feed your plants. Have you ever tried that? Uh, no, I guess that's a new one that I'm going to have to look into, you know, it really and truly the night, not really extracting, you wouldn't be extracting much nitrogen. That's why, you know, now if you're going to compost weeds, there are certain ones that you don't want to do. This would be one of them because I don't think they ever really die. Um, Bittercress is another one. But if you want to take, you know, plants that have just their green still there and you want to chop them up, throw them in your compost bin. You're not going to get much 
soaking them in water and your house is probably going to smell. Yep. So one thing I've read is pine straw makes your soil acidic. Nope. And that was always thought, you know, to be true. You know, it's not something terrible. It pine, once the pine is dry, it's really lost all of that. It's a very nice mulch. It's, it's a little messy. It's great to use maybe in your vegetable garden. I wouldn't use it in my landscape, although I know in the South, that's the predominant mulch. Whereas up here we have more hardwood mulches. Right. But yeah, you know, it's nice. It breaks down. It's pretty. It blows away if you don't have it watered down. But it doesn't really do anything to the acidity at all. In fact, when you have pine needles drop down like you have your annual uh, cast, it you know it breaks down pretty quickly. It doesn't stay in the soil. So I've tried lots of garden mists trying to control powdery mildew, especially on my bee balm. Can you give me a tip that might actually work? Because milk doesn't work. I nope. can tell you that. <laughs> now, uh, now, there was a recipe using, I'm trying to remember, potassium carbonate or potassium. That's your field, not mine. Um, but there's actually an organic fungicide that I love using. It's called Serenade. Oh, yeah. And it works very well on powdery mildew. Right. And, you know, the trick with powdery mildew, especially there's certain bee bombs that it's like you have bee bomb, you automatically have powdery mildew. So you require really good air circulation, no overhead watering. The humidity is not going to help you, though. And water at the bottom. But that's kind of, there are some that have, I believe, uh, um, Jacob, Jacob is one. Jacob's Klein, yeah. Jacob Klein actually is one that is uh, more immune to it. Doesn't mean it won't get it, but it's less likely to. Let's go with that. There's no such thing in horticulture as being absolute. So other tips or tricks that you can have this time of year, we obviously are in, in the season where you're having to spend a lot of time out watering, what are some tricks that definitely work for reducing your watering? So I actually have a video up on YouTube and you know, the hay racks that everybody has and they're, they're a pain to take care of because you know, you put them in, you put all, you know, you're pine soil in and you water them and you water them and you water them and you water them some more. So one of the tricks is using the hay rack, take a plastic bag, garbage bag. I use my potty mix bags when I'm done with them and line them. There's, I poke one hole, just one hole, line it in, put my soil in, and then put my plants in. It, it does help reduce the watering. It, it's not perfect, but it works. The other thing I do is when your hay racks get kind of ratty looking, which they do after a couple of seasons, I pull them apart and I dress, I use, um, I don't do hay racks, but I do um, a lot of boxes and containers. I put it on top, I pull it, and it makes a nice little mulch for it and it dresses it up pretty well and that works. And I own a couple of the world's best self-watering hanging baskets. Oh. Um, it, they're called the Weekender. The smallest size is a 16 inch pot, which works for me because I grow super tunias in them and they need that space. And what it is, is a two part pot. So you have your decorative outside pot and it comes in different colors. Inside is a, um, a, a knitter pot that you lift up and it's perforated. And there's a gap about this much between the bottom of that to the bottom of the pot itself. And it has capillary matting it, it fixed so it's in the water and then up into the, the black pot where you, and you put your potty mix in there. So you kind of leave the capillary matting up there. And so most self-watering containers, your plants have to wait till the roots get down to the water. This way, when you plant them, they're getting the water immediately. Oh, that's great. I and, did put that link in the chat and we'll put yeah, um, it as well. 
he, you know, I, I happened to see this guy at a trade show and I asked him about it. Like, and I actually bought it. If anybody works for local governments or your office or something, they actually make bigger ones. This is the smallest one they have. I had 22 inch hanging baskets. They do require sturdy hangers. It's not something that you just like put on a little hook and hope it doesn't kill somebody. But, <laughs> <laughs> and there's actually an overflow place for it. Or if you just like the size of the container, there's a little plug that you can take out and just let it go. But it's great. I will send you the link for it. It is, it, it's a great product. I just love it. And unfortunately, I had to buy it at a trade show. He does sell them online. Right. Um, so we had somebody kind of ask a clarifying question on our uh, recommendation of the horticultural vinegar. Um, just to go back to the subject so that everybody's on the same page, we had a, a, a someone that were asked for about lesser celadine um, in a wooded area with water. So we had to be super careful about ask or talking about any kind of pesticide and Denise is certified in this. So we are very cognizant of waterways and pesticides. So she was recommending, and I also agree with her that you cut it back really low and dig up those tubers. Um, in my own tiny forest, I have a lot of very invasive porcelain berry, bar berry. Uh, I've got um, uh, the uh, multiflora rose, and I can tell you uh, where did I spend my, uh, you know, my time during COVID. I was out in that tiny forest hacking at that stuff constantly. And you should be there with your flamethrower. Right. Uh, so, uh, but the the bottom line was I was rewarded this spring with a carpet of ephemerals. So, um, you know, the vinegar is not ideal, but when you're trying to control a large area, you might not have a choice because I cannot imagine this poor person digging those tubers out by hand by themselves. Uh, it's going to be a lot of work. So, um, but I would recommend if you can cut them before they flower. I like Denise as I am out hiking, I pull up uh, invasive garlic mustard, trying to prevent it from flowering because that will eventually kill it. So um, and something else too with the, because uh, person was worried about the waterways and the amphibians, we're not drenching the soil. We are spraying it. Now, my understanding was the thistle isn't growing in the water. It's just growing in uh, the lawn or whatever. So you could very easily use it. You don't have to worry about the amphibians. Actually, uh, here again, because I am a licensed applicator, there is a form of glyphosate that does not contain the wetting agent and is actually used for waterways, especially if you're trying to control Japanese knotweed, which tends to grow along creeks. That's one of the few things you can actually use because you can't dig up not weak because you just actually spread it that way. Right. So that's just a, a little point of information there. So uh, I wanted to talk about compost and compost tea. Oh yeah. So, yeah. So compost is great. It's wonderful. You know, you get all those rich nutrients for your plants and you know, your plants are happy. It's rich. It doesn't smell you can buy bag compost. That's perfectly acceptable, especially if you know you can't have a compost bin or a container of some sort. Compost tea is a different story. So I was taking a food certification class and talking to the people from our health department who, who run that certification. And you can get E. coli and salmonella from compost tea. And I know a lot of gardeners, yeah, a lot of people like to use that because they think it's adding valuable nutrients. Some people spray it on their fruits and vegetables and their leaves because they think it's going to use it as a fungicide, which by the way, according to the EPA, it is not a fungicide, just if you're interested in that. But what it does is because when you are making compost tea, it's anaerobic composting. And as a result, you lose the very few microbes that may survive. And then you're spreading the compost tea. Now, you know, people might think, well, you know, I'm okay and everything, but you may have a child in the garden or the landscape 
you may have a patient going through chemotherapy, the elderly, and let's face it, it we're better about washing our hands, but a lot of people still aren't. And just touching it, touching your mouth, you know, you got to pull a hair out of your mouth or something like that. You can very easily get sick that way. My brother-in-law, now not because he was doing compost tea, had salmonella um, through one of those outbreaks. He was in the hospital for two weeks. Mm. He um, almost had his kidneys shut down. He still has some residual effects from it. So is it really worth it? Use the compost. Just use the compost. Skip the tea completely. Yeah, no, that's that's great advice. We certainly want to be safe while we're gardening. And certainly that really means, you know, making sure that before you head out in the garden, you're probably cover, properly covered. And then to, you know, be very careful when you're opening those bags, uh, you know, that have been sitting in the hot sun that, you know, you're not uh, bringing home an unwelcome visitor. I saw someone who opened their bag to find snake eggs and little tiny snakes in their compost bags. So good guys. Ah, so just, uh, yeah, be careful, uh, you know, uh, when opening bagged products that you are not uh, introducing somebody you weren't expecting in your garden. I just have nightmares about that. Oh, oh so. I have to have those pets. <laughs> <laughs> now, speaking of uh, soil, even potting mix, I know a lot of people like to work in the garden and don't wear gloves. I always wear gloves. Um, yeah. In fact, I just bought two pair at the flower show. There was a guy selling the Atlas 370 nitrils, which I just love. I use them at work, but you can get ringworm. And yeah. if you've ever had ringworm, it's miserable and disgusting. Yeah. You have to use separate sheets, separate towels, wash everything in hot water. You've got to use special creams. You've got to take a drug which can cause liver damage in order to get rid of it. I actually got it from my one of my cats who and you know i won't even tell you what they told me to use on her head um but always wear gloves you know especially like the nitro tip ones you get fingertip control and it's much better than putting all that money out for the drugs and liver damage and whatever else can go on right well and there are plants that in some people cause sensitivity um, they may not be poisonous like poison ivy, but they may cause you to be itchy. And I cannot stand that. And we have a lot of poison ivy on this property, which by the way, your shawl can live on uh, five your five years on your equipment. So if you are cutting it, make sure you come in and you really clean your equipment. I put in the chat, my favorite gloves. Um, I got them last year from Bergeon and Ball, um, but they are leather palmed and then they're a beautiful fabric on the back. It is perfect time of year if you're looking for dad for a great gift in the garden, especially if dad likes to deal with chemicals, hopefully not mixing the way that we just discovered some gentlemen are doing it. But I definitely recommend a great pair of garden gloves for any gardener. They will always thank you because we are constantly leaving our gloves where we shouldn't be leaving them. So extra pairs are welcome, not to mention they get really dirty. So sometimes just having an extra pair that you can wear that isn't wet or dirty is really welcome. So highly recommend that. So considering where you live, you know, there's a lot of the old time farmers and there's a lot of mystica. So I know that people are you know, they plant crops by the sun, the moon, the stars, whether it's a root crop, vegetable, flower, whatever. You might as, it, does, it doesn't matter. You could dance around a fire naked. It's not <laughs> going to matter what, when you plant it, except it. you cannot accurately reproduce the same conditions every year at the same time, the same soil moisture, the same um, nutrients that are in there. It's nice. Grandma might have gotten lucky once, you know, and, and oh, yeah, we have to plant, you know, carrots by the waning moon or whatever it is. Um, another favorite of mine is uh, have a pregnant woman plant your seeds because she's fertile. It means you will have a good crop. Now, you ask some woman that's seven, eight, nine months pregnant, you're going to end up in the ground because she's going to take a shovel and, and 
put it, put it into your head. Well, we, you. we can run this question by my marketing uh, guru, Alyssa, who is nine months pregnant right now. You want to come over in the garden in 90 degree heat and plant anything, Alyssa? Just asking. No, no, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was going to be the answer because she's got to go to a graduation ceremony tonight and I'm a little concerned that it's a little too hot so Auntie Heather was having a conversation about maybe she needs to sit in the car in the AC and watch graduation because I just think it's too hot to be outside. Yeah tonight. or get one of those little fans that has the water mister on it and everything but even yeah. still I, I would say congratulations here's a card I'll see you later in the air conditioning. Exactly. Some people do so a lot of people use coyote urine or lion urine to repel the deer, which you know, lion, you know, deer don't know what lions are. Coyotes, they know. But keep in mind, using coyote urine can also attract them in oh. the mating season because, you know, they mark their territory and say, hey, babe, I'm available. You know? <laughs> so keep in mind, it is effective. It is effective. But do it away from the house. I mean... I live less than 10 miles from downtown Pittsburgh. Literally, when you see the stadiums on TV, 10 miles is not that much. I'm in a suburb, but a, a fairly close suburb. But I have coyotes. They're sheep farms about two miles away. I usually see them on the way to dinner. But, oh. <laughs> but I have Very. a fence. I do have a fence, but I don't want you know, them in the yard. So yeah. I don't use that. I don't have to worry about that. We also have a very large dog. But some people will have their husbands do the perimeter of their yard. Um, <laughs> that can get you arrested. Yeah. <laughs> Well, it's also adding a lot of nitrogen, and I mean a lot of nitrogen, which can cause some issues in some plants. So not, not only that, it's you're going to literally have to have an IV going in one end so it can come out the other. <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm, I'm not for that. I'm, I'm afraid that uh, what it might do to the garden. But certainly, Miss Know It All, you are always full of surprises and tricks. And although we didn't get to see our star of our show. Uh, we appreciate you being here so much. If people want to get in touch with you, uh, or maybe they want to buy a great book for Father's Day, uh, if you want to tell them where they can find you. Okay, so you can reach me at Edible Flowers, the number one, at AOL.com. Just put flowers, something in the subject heading so you don't end up in my spam box, although I do uh, check my spam. And I am in Pittsburgh. So if you're looking for a speaker, I'm also available. I travel. I've traveled as far as Seattle and Charleston, South Carolina. So I do move and I do spend a lot of time out in central and eastern Pennsylvania um, because I know where all the garden centers are out there. <laughs> Yeah, so we, we'd love to come and have a, a talk to your group as well as uh, visit your garden center. Uh, certainly our YouTube page for The Thoughtful Garden is gardenthoughtfully.com and we put helpful tips and tricks and we'd love for you to join us there. I just put a beautiful native plant garden here locally up yesterday. And if you wanna get inspired of how to incorporate those into your landscape, that is a garden that will definitely get you motivated to think about that. So thank you guys so much for I being here. I will send you those links for the uh, self-watering hanging baskets. Yes, and I put that in our chat. Uh, we pulled it up while you were talking and we'll make sure that all of those get into the Facebook page as well. So thank you guys for joining us. We really oh, appreciate it. Have a great day. All right, take care. See ya. Bye now. Bye-bye.